Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Many Hoosiers spent the summer traveling beyond the state, but there are incredible destinations you'll only find right here in Indiana. Discover one-of-a-kind automobiles at the Studebaker National Museum in South Bend. Watch planes take to the skies at the Academy of Model Aeronautics headquarters in Muncie. Explore one of the only operational museum ships in the country at Evansville's LST-325 Memorial and watch military history come alive at Vincennes Indiana Military Museum. From sky to sea, it's time to go. Stay tuned for the travel destinations in your own backyard. Welcome to the weekly special, I'm Erica Sagone. You've traveled on tank trips with us across the state from South Bend to Evansville and everywhere in between. And many of those towns have featured world-renowned destinations that draw thousands of visitors each year. Well, one of the first industries to put Indiana on the map was automobiles. And the Studebaker National Museum in South Bend is a great place to learn more. What became the Studebaker Corporation started as H&C Studebaker a blacksmith shop in February of 1852. Brothers Henry and Clem opened a shop in downtown South Bend, which at that time was just a fledgling community on the shores of the St. Joseph River. Soon the company grew. Younger brother John M. Studebaker joined the firm in the late 1850s. Other brothers Peter and Jacob Studebaker joined up in the 1860s, and they now called themselves the Studebaker Brothers Manufacturing Company. By the turn of the 19th century, the Studebaker Brothers Manufacturing Company uh, was the world's largest manufacturer of horse-drawn equipment. Studebaker entered the automobile market by uh, basically marketing vehicles built by other companies. Studebaker had the worldwide dealer network, they had the name recognition. Uh, what they didn't have were uh, facilities to build automobiles, so they purchased uh, several companies, uh, the largest being the EMF Company of Detroit, Michigan. By this time, the Studebaker Corporation was really looking at getting out of the horse-drawn market in the uh, late teens, but World War I intervened. Uh, it was still a war fought mainly with horse-drawn vehicles, so they kept uh, producing a lot of equipment for World War I. But after the war ended, Studebaker, they knew the horse and buggy was on its way out, and they began overhauling the South Bend plant to produce automobiles and slowly began phasing out of Detroit in the 1920s. Studebaker was going uh, great guns in the 1920s. Unfortunately, their uh, leaders really underestimated the Great Depression. In 1933, Studebaker was broke and was entered receivership. Uh, they were able to reorganize. They convinced the bankruptcy court judges that the best way to satisfy their creditors was to continue building automobiles. And the company was actually able to keep going uh, and by 1935 was back on the road to profitability. Once we get into the 30s and 40s, Studebaker was looking at styling as their calling card. They realized they didn't have the volume that the other manufacturers that they had to produce a better product, a different product, something that would set themselves apart from the market. That formula really propelled them to their greatest heights in the late 40s and early 50s. And uh, even today, those Studebaker automobiles are looked at icons of American automobile design. Weight is the enemy was one of their mantras. They wanted a very efficient automobile, but they also embraced really the aircraft styling theme that's reflected in uh, Studebaker's bullet nose models of 1950. You know, there's a big old propeller sitting out on the front of the car and it looks like, uh, you know, just a World War II fighter airplane coming out of the sky. They looked to Europe a lot for inspiration and that was a direct influence on Studebaker's masterpiece, the 1953 Starliner. It's probably best described as a jazz quintet amid a, a whole field of chamber music. It was low, it was rakish, it was half a foot lower than anything else on the market. It completely separated Studebaker from the rest of the industry, which was you know, very perpendicular and kind of boxy, and here the new streamlined Studebakers come out and everyone's going, wow, look what Studebaker did.
Studebaker was trying to make it on 4% of the market when GM was selling, you know, 45% of the market. Studebaker just did not have the resources to compete at that level, and unfortunately, we're not able to compete past the 1960s. Studebaker's closing was a devastating blow to the community, and there's, there's no two ways about it. It was probably the single most tragic occurrence in, in the history of South Bend. 7,000 employees were basically thrown out of work two weeks before Christmas in 1963. But the community did respond. And by 1966, unemployment was back at pre-closing levels. And if you look at South Bend today and the strengths it brought, you know, that was really tested by Studebaker's closing. And I think the community came out much stronger for it. And even today, there's three degrees of separation, it seems, from Studebaker at almost anything you point to in this town. Hospitals, churches, parks. The automobiles aren't being built here anymore, but Studebaker is very much a part of South Bend's cultural fabric. The Studebaker National Museum's collection includes everything from some of the most popular Studebaker vehicles made to uh, one-of-a-kind show cars, prototypes, and other vehicles you're never going to see anywhere else because there's only one of them. Some people uh, will say, oh, my first car is a Studebaker, my parents had Studebakers. Others are just learning about Studebakers for the first time and think they're cool cars. There's so many different ways for people to experience the Studebaker story. We're just delighted that uh, many of them come by and do so. We're just a short drive away. Don't miss their newest exhibit, Hoosier Made, World Driven, about the history of car making in Indiana. Get more information at studebakermuseum.org. The golden era of automobiles was also the golden era of aircraft, and for many future pilots, the first taste of flight started at home. Just outside Muncie, along a stretch of country road and tucked among fields of Indiana corn, sits a nationally recognized museum dedicated to over 200 years of aviation. A lot of people think of aviation in general, and they think, well, the Wright brothers invented the airplane, everything followed after them. Well, actually, more than 100 years before the Wright brothers, there were people experimenting, trying to understand how to successfully fly, how to design, how to build a full-size aircraft. And one of the first people to do that was Sir George Cayley. And he used models, a model glider and a feather helicopter that was powered by a whalebone. And using those models, he did his research and wrote a early paper, is actually the first one, called On Aerial Navigation. So that feather helicopter, you're looking at 1796, the early rubber band powered airplanes being flown in the 1870s. And so by the time the Wright brothers successfully fly their airplane in Kitty Hawk, there's really a better understanding of what's involved in the lift. You start to see model magazines for kids, like St. Nicholas magazine, as well as a lot of full-scale aviation magazines, start to have sections in them on model airplanes. And at almost the exact same time in New York, a lady by the name of Lillian Todd forms the very first model airplane club. She really sees the value of aviation in general and how much of a great tool it is for kids. And in 1915, they hold the very first model airplane contest. As the contest grew in number and scale across the country, the competitive spirit helped fuel technological innovations and designs. As a result, model enthusiasts sought to establish a governing body for the model industry. During the 1936 national championships, organizers founded the Academy of Model Aeronautics. The nationals were one of the vital parts of the Academy of Model Aeronautics. In the early days, it was how did you build your airplane? You know, what techniques, what tips, what materials did you use that made your airplane better? In 1923, it was one rubber band powered event. Well, by the 70s, you have free flight, which is the oldest form of modeling where you just let the airplane go and it's timed for how long it will fly. There's control line where the modeler is standing in the center of a circle and they're controlling it with a handle that has one or more lines that are connected to the airplane. And then you have radio control. And so, Going from one event to now having a multitude of different events within those three types, it became more and more difficult to try to find a flying location. 
And so in the 1980s, the board decided that they really needed to try and look for a national flying site. They eventually settled on the site here in Muncie. We have about 1,100 acres, and about 800 of that is devoted and available for flying models from. Today, the site includes the Academy of Model Aeronautics National Headquarters. They're one of a kind museum dedicated to the history of model aviation, and of course, competitions. We've had upwards of 30 countries actually send teams here to Muncie flying model airplanes. What's so great when they come is it's just like the Olympics. They walk in with their flag and you get to meet all of these people from all over the world who have the exact same interests. They all love model aviation, which is always really neat to see, especially in the museum when they come in because they've read about some of these airplanes. It joins one of almost 10,000 pieces that trace everything from the model airplanes themselves to patches, pins, hats, uh, jackets, pennants. So we try to tie all of that together and the museum does rotate things around. So what you come in and see this time, you might not see later on. So what's neat for us is to be able to have this flying site where visitors, for example, they can see in the museum a radio controlled pylon racing aircraft and read about it but then on occasion they can actually go out on site and see that event. It makes a, a wonderful opportunity to see the history here and then see active current participation by the modelers out on site. The museum recently received designation as a civilian museum with the National Museum of the United States Air Force program, displaying the latest concepts and technologies being tested by NASA Dryden for visitors to see. For them to be able to come in and see the hobby aspect of it, but then especially for families that bring in kids where they can see, yes, they could get involved in a hobby, but in today's world of unmanned air vehicle, there is a tremendous amount of possibilities for those kids for careers. It really ties the past and the present and the future all together. There's nowhere else in the United States that you can go that you can see all of these things together. For a visitor, I think it's a really neat opportunity that just here in Muncie, you know, next to a, an 1100 acre field is a treasure like we've got. This month, the Academy will host their first annual Fort Wayne Warbirds and Classic Fly-In. Learn more at modelaircraft.org. Warbirds are not new to the state. During World War II, the Republic Aviation Corporation in Evansville produced over 6,000 P-47 Thunderbolts. But Evansville didn't just manufacture planes. They were also the largest inland producer of LST boats in the country. The USS LST-325 was originally commissioned 70 years ago for service in World War II. She and her crew made more than 40 trips from England to France, delivering prisoners, supplies, and wounded. She was present on D-Day when more than 160,000 Allied troops stormed the beaches at Normandy. In 1964, LST-325 was sold to the Greek Navy. And in 1999, after nearly 60 years of service around the world, she was nearing the end of her life. It was ready for the scrapyard. That's what the Greek Navy was going to do. They were going to scrap this. And in all fairness, it's understandable why. Nothing worked on this ship. I don't know how many individuals came to Greece to work on this, but it was quite a few. They came to work and they came to bring LST-325, purchased from the Greek Navy for one dollar, home to the United States. They'd come and they'd go, and then in the end, there were 28 men that made the journey to the United States. So normally the ship had a crew of, back in World War II of between 110 and 115 crew members plus seven officers. So you can see what 20, 28 men did by themselves and they were all senior citizens. It, it's, it was quite a feat. She made a prolonged stop for repairs in Mobile, Alabama. Then in 2005, LST-325 was sailed to Evansville, her new home port. And although it was most certainly a day for celebration, it was also the beginning of a lot of work for a lot of dedicated volunteers. 
to restore it to its former glory is still a work in progress, and it always will be. But everything you see has been restored in some way or another, be it a piece of plating cut out that's been rusted away, it being painted, the list goes on. Everywhere you look on the ship, something has been done to restore it or to make it look as it did back in the days it was built. Everything that you see down in this room is fully operational. This is the machinery we use, the engines we use when we sail the ship. Through this hatch, we'll be going into the auxiliary engine room. This is where the ship's generators are. This is the ship's electrical distribution panel. Uh, some sailors also refer to it as a Frankenstein board. As you can see, there is no hand protection. If a sailor in a rough sea slipped, fell, reached in here to grab something to steady himself, he'd get electrocuted. That's where the majority of our funding goes, is just to keep this ship seaworthy and be able to sail under its own power. It's a never-ending uh, program, and there are thousands and thousands of hours have gone into this. But the work doesn't end in the engine room. One of the LST's most unique features is also one of its most difficult to maintain. Where we're standing right now, this is called the bow ramp. This is where vehicles would enter and exit during an amphibious landing. When the ramp is closed, that makes the watertight seal. You can see the gasket there. They bring the ramp up, they dog it down, then they close the doors. And just behind the bow ramp is the tank deck. This is the main reason for this ship being built right here. This deck is 30 feet wide by 288 feet long. It will accommodate 20 Sherman tanks in two rows of 10. They also had vehicles up on the main deck, and the way they got those up there is above us is the ship's elevator. Vehicles that come in, they drive it, they drive it up on the elevator, until eventually the main deck was full. Then they'd start loading this deck. Today, LST-325's decks are filled with tourists, not tanks, middle school students instead of military cargo. But she still has a mission. Our mission is to educate the public. By taking the ship to different ports, that's where we get the funding to keep the ship operational. We might be gone for a month, stop at four different cities, and put 40,000 people through this ship in a month's time. There were 1,051 of these built back during World War II. This is the last surviving fully operational LST in the United States and possibly the world. This ship is military correct. And like I say, it's fully, it's fully operational. We sail the ship every year. The history of that is, uh, when you dwell on it, you, you can get teary-eyed. Uh, you, you think about uh, the people that landed on Normandy from this ship and gave their lives for the freedoms that we have today. Right now, we're, we're standing on the deck of history. This is history. The LST-325 will set sail on its annual tour at the end of the month. Find more information at their website, lstmemorial.org. And one of the most comprehensive military museums is right here in Indiana. Located in Vincennes, the Indiana Military Museum brings history alive for both young and old. My uh, interest in military history and memorabilia goes all the way back to when I was a child five years old. And my father uh, built drive-in theaters. 
and this was right after World War II. Guess what? Lots of World War II movies and, and all sorts of uh, war movies being played. And I, it just was, became natural. I, I became interested in military items, military artifacts, and military history because I saw so many John Wayne movies, I suppose. My dad was not a collector, but he came home one day with a Civil War musket that someone had given. They owed him 20 or 30 bucks and they gave him the musket. <laughs> and so I, I remember that, you know, that I took charge of that musket right away. I remember it was much taller than I was at the time. And then followed very shortly thereafter, the next door neighbor, a veteran of World War II, was going out to the trash with things he brought back from the war, the German helmet and a flag and a belt and so forth. And he looked at me and he said, here, you know, that was, that was the beginning of the collection at probably seven years old. And then to be able to see and touch these same kind of artifacts just brought it all alive. The museum that will allow you to walk up and, and actually touch a tank or an old vehicle or whatever it might be, that, that's exciting. So I continued as a young boy to, to accumulate artifacts from whoever would let me have them. And, so through high school I did that, and then in college I continued to do that. And, and so it, the collection began to grow and grow, filling my parents' basement. All this time I kept collecting and collecting. But I think the big transition was that when uh, I acquired uh, some vehicles and some artillery, the big things, and started popping those in the backyard, uh, it became more serious. Once I started acquiring big things like artillery pieces and first thing was a Jeep and then it was a half track and, and then later on it goes to a tank and something else. People always suggested, well, you know, you really need to put this stuff in a museum so people can really see and appreciate these things. And so ultimately in 1984 we incorporated the museum into a 501c3 not-for-profit museum corporation and established the museum in that fashion. So then items that the museum accumulated, of course, belonged to the museum. Items that I had previously accumulated that I continue to donate to the museum, still doing that today. And, and of course, we operated on volunteer, uh, and we still operate only on, on total volunteers. We have a core of about 50 or 60 serious volunteers with the museum right now. The way we were expanding, we knew we had to find a new location. So six years ago, we began a campaign to raise the funds to purchase the land we're on now, this 14 acres, which is right downtown Vincennes, adjacent to the George Rogers Clark National Park, and uh, gives us lots of room for expansion, and it had some existing buildings, so we're, we're able to expand and, and, and have lots of new plans for the future. The events are what we call living history events. You, the reenactors come in fully equipped. They come up and set, set their camps up, set their displays up. They'll go into these trenches. People can walk around and see all of these things just as they would have been during World War I or World War II or even the Civil War. And so they're, they're great for everybody. You know, the young and old, they all enjoy this. They, they put on once a day, at least, they put on a mock battle. Plus, uh, we may have some World War II uh, veterans who will still uh, get up and tell their stories and, and interviews. And it's just an exciting weekend when we have these uh, events uh, and, and the whole family can come out and enjoy. It, it does bring history alive to the fullest. Uh, you know, when, when you can see something like that, instead of on film or on the page in a book, there it is in real life. And talk to these uh, collectors and these, these uh, living history people who love to get into this. And it's, it's a real educational process as well. It's gratifying to see the school groups come in, to see young people excited about what they're seeing, and so that they understand what the cost of, of freedom has been for our country and what men and women in our armed services have had to do to, to maintain the freedoms we enjoy. And I think that's the goal, the ultimate goal, of course, of, of what we're doing. And um, we have a lot of uh, veterans who come in as, as our docents and meet those school groups and talk to them. And, and those are fantastic ways in which we can help the, the young people understand. There have to be new uh, young people, there have to be another generation that, that, that picks up where we leave off. And, and so when you see a young person come in here, and I mean, I've seen boys and girls, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old that, that know more about this stuff than I did when I was that age. We're achieving a lot by nurturing those people. You know, some people are satisfied with a book or satisfied with a DVD and a movie or whatever, but if, it, if a person comes here because they're interested in history and they're just going to be satisfied that, hey, I've, I've, I've seen as good as I can see, 
th this is a package right here they can't beat anywhere else. Go to a museum where you can see the artifacts that were there when something happened. Brings it all to life. The museum will host their annual salute to World War II veterans during Labor Day weekend. Learn more at indianamilitarymuseum.org. Four incredible destinations in your own backyard to inspire the traveler in you. Thanks for joining us. Before we go, Woody Pines. Good night. One, two, one, two, three. Said along John had him a pair of shoes, crazy shoes. Never did see, you got a heel in the front, got a heel behind. Never tell a witch for long, John was gone. He was long, gone, long gone. In the moment, every time that you say he was long, man. gone, long gone. Said along, John had him a funny little boat, crazy boat, every day flew. He got an engine in the front, got a motor behind. Never tell a witch for long, John was gone. He was long, gone, long gone. He was long now. Where'd he go, buddy? Where'd he go? Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 